Welcome back to the Carb Appropriate Podcast. I am stoked today to have my good buddy, Professor Grant Schofield with me. Welcome, Grant. Hey, Cliff, and thanks for having me on. My pleasure. Hey, so we met quite a few years ago now, but um, really it was a, as a result of, I had recently come back from Canada. I was getting back into practice here, and one of our mutual friends who was studying up at AET at the time, Joe McQuillan, said yeah. um, that this guy... Grant Schofield starting to look a little bit into low carb. And so uh, do you want to come up and we'll have a chat? And I think you, you called it the metabolic efficiency group. We got together with a bunch of other people and started fleshing out ideas um, for research. And obviously before that, I had known you mainly for your work in movement and the sort of psychology of getting kids active. Um, I, I think it's a really interesting genesis story for you of how you came to be doing what you're doing now. So how did that all come about from your background in psychology and sports physiology and movement into being really one of the, the key pundits for the low carb movement? Oh, yeah, it's an interesting story and it goes well back beyond there and you were involved peripherally as well. And I'd known a bit about nutrition and then I'd done degrees in physiology and psychology and I was interested in both of those and about the only thing I'd ever had any real interest in when I was a school kid was science that's the only stuff that appealed to me, particularly biology. I was interested in that. And I'd known of the nutrition guidelines and I'd studied those in various aspects and just sort of gone, oh, yeah, hadn't made much connection with reality. And I just carried on. And I'd ended up, because of my interest in sport and athletics through my life, uh, sort of coinciding with that outbreak of the realisation in the mid-90s that with the U.S. Surgeon General had finally published a report going, well, look, you know, uh, being physically fit and moving around is good for you. That spurred a whole academic industry, I guess, if you'd like, but sort of the more robust, supported investigation of that. So I'd spent from the sort of mid-90s through to about 2010, at least, as that being the main focus of my career, is about how to be active, uh, particularly the public health aspects of that, and particularly interested in children and and young people and the, the uh, you know, sort of often your academic career follows the life stages you're in. I had started to get young children and understand the the world that those kids were building, being born into was one where they didn't move much. And actually, compared to now, that's actually a high, <laughs> at least we just had video players then, but we don't have devices and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so, so that was really the thing. And I'd, I'd known about nutrition. I'd been interested in sports nutrition, particularly because I'd been an, an, uh, an endurance athlete my whole life, and I just bought the whole Gatorade gel, low-fat, high-carb thing, hand over fist. And it should have occurred to me more than that that something different was going on because I'd met the at one Hawaii Ironman. I'd actually ended up breaking my collarbone in a cycling accident just before it, and so I turned up anyway, and I actually ended up doing the race it had sort of healed just in time, but I was obviously unfit. So I sat in the pro briefing next to a man, Mark Allen, and a woman, Paula Newby Fraser, that's both sort of seven or eight time champions, and asked them about their diet because I was just like, I might as well learn something while I'm here. And they told me what's well, sort of low carbohydrate approach. We have a lot of fat. We encourage fat burning. We use nutritional ketosis, the whole box and dice. And I've just gone, <laughs> what a load of nonsense. So I ignored that. And then I had actually heard of, of you before you departed overseas. and. This guy and you know, Cliff Harvey was doing low carb and ketogenic diets, and we we're like, oh, oh yeah, well, yeah, geez, okay, there's still a lunatic <laughs> fringe. There's definitely still a lunatic fringe in the world. Imagine that. <laughs> and, <laughs> so I had known about you actually, and then through Joe, I'd known he'd known you, and you know, we sort of generally laughed at what you were doing. And yeah, you know, that's just shameful in hindsight because I, I got interested in this around 2012, and then started just to unpack all the evidence around that sort of Tim Noakes coming yeah. out era and yeah that world just exploded and then i had naively sort of thought this would be the gentle world of physical activity and exercise research where everyone got along and, <laughs> and, stuff. and uh it's just been a whole nother world a, a sort of battlefield of academics and medical professionals the food industry pharmaceuticals and all those the conflicts of interest and the dissonance that come along with that so yeah and then I uh, eventually met you, and we, as you say, we got into that group, and then uh, you've come along and contributed even more to our group with the, your trials and uh, other work and the, the general discussion that is necessary to keep moving for, for food forward. 
Yeah, well, it was it was interesting for me because, as you know, I was moving much more down the mind body path, and I was actually starting my my masters in mind body healthcare at AUT. Right. Yeah. Um, but it was really nice to have a group of people who were coming on board and I, I had some collaborators then to sort of fight back against some of these silly things that were happening in nutrition. So um, as you can remember, I was pretty excited about the whole thing and probably a little bit too excitable at times. Um, but what was really the the aha moment for you? Because obviously you started to see the writing on the wall, but what really changed your perspective on nutrition? Well, I think there was three things, but there was one big moment. First of all, I've been doing a lot of work in the remote Pacific with non-communicable disease for the World Health Organization. And you walk around with these ridiculous guidelines that you were supposed to be preaching, you can only imagine. And of course you'll go to, it was such profound differences in the metabolic health of people in the Pacific. The people living in the traditional manner where they've really got very little contact with the outside world, you know, Southern Vanuatu is probably the best exemplifies that, this uh, extraordinary good health. And not only that, you'll see people really living that Mark Sisson description of living long and dropping dead. So there's really an idiopathic yeah. death over a couple of weeks that's celebrated and otherwise a healthy, full life. And you absorb, absorb the differences between that when you get to a sort of urban urbanization of the Pacific, it's say like Vila or, or uh, Nandi, uh, these sorts of places. And then whole places like uh, the island of Tarawa, uh, Kiribati is like this, where there's really no local food supply and it's all gone down to sugary drinks and two-minute noodles. And the metabolic health is profound mm. and the amputations and whatnot are going on. So that that is one thing that was going on gently and you'd think it would be more less gentle than that. Uh, but really, it was just when we started doing work in, in metabolic flexibility with athletes and then people with type 2 diabetes just measuring. And we'd done this for years without thinking about it, the respiratory exchange, the ratio of expired carbon dioxide to oxygen, and then trying to understand fuel utilization. And you saw that people were just pure carb burners uh, or other people had this more developed flexibility where they could utilize fatty acids as a fuel when they're sleeping and resting and at low levels of exercise. And then they supplemented that with more and more carbohydrate burning as the exercise became more intense. Yeah. And that's when it really occurred to me. And I think also at the same time we had the Tim Noakes coming out stuff. And uh, he, he certainly has been a hero of mine. I think uh, someone who I regarded as smart for my whole life and then to change his mind. I challenged Karen Zinn, who had finished her doctoral studies with me in nutrition in a more conventional way, I should say. Uh, uh, about this, and we both went away, and then we did a lot of work in insulin anemia with us, and it just the world just came crashing in. And I, I don't mean in a negative way; it was very exciting. Um, but then, then the political and sort of social ramifications of that uh, came home to roost, and it's been a, a massive fight ever since. Yeah, it's it's funny, even the terminology that we use, you know, Tim Noakes coming out, you know, things <laughs> like that. It's, it's, it's pretty crazy to think that by positing something a little bit different to the accepted norm, but pursuing it through the scientific method, you're, you're yep. basically outed as being a heretic, but th that's the scientific method in a nutshell, right? As you develop a hypothesis and you explore it. Exactly. And uh, Dr. Simon Thornley, who we both know well, um, as a colleague and he's been involved in, in the doctoral work that you've been doing as well, I mean, he's very strong on that, the idea of science and, and what evidence says and where, you, it, you, where it takes you. And yeah, that is the scientific method that you you develop hypotheses and you're skeptical about knowledge and then you could either move the body of knowledge in one direction or another. Uh, yeah. Either way, either outcome, the, the knowledge moves, you're either more certain about this or you're less certain about this. But that's not what happens in reality. I think the humanity of of the scientist means that you're driven into a space of of that vision of the anointed and and cognitive dissonance to say, well, yeah, mistakes may have been made, but not by us. So it's very hard for the for the for, for a functioning human to go, yeah, actually, this was all wrong. And I think we're seeing that more and more. Not the least has been, and, and we've got to watch both you and I that we don't end up those people. I mean, gosh, we 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 so we don't want to be but yeah. you know what we're humans uh yeah. and that's probably the biggest fear i have in my research and public health career is that we become those that we've most criticized 
not open to change because again the knowledge will change in our lifetimes for sure yeah i think um simon thornley is an unsung hero i think of low carb and the you know the exploration of it here in new zealand yeah. and he has been such a um a valuable resource for me to be able to go to the last couple of years because he's he's really brought back home that you you can be strong in your opinions you can craft strong hypotheses you can pursue them consummately yeah. but you can also be uh, you know excited about what you're doing and you can you can write in that way you know getting back to the old Feynman's and whatnot who used to write with a swashbuckling style I think now it's become too dry and, and too yeah. jargonistic yeah. no one can understand it and no one really cares because everyone's whitewashing what they put out anyway exactly now um, I'll tell you a story about Simon that he told me the other day because he's all he's on to all sorts of alternative hypotheses what as any good public health scientist should be and the one he was talking about here has actually nothing to do with nutrition it's to do with with the development of rheumatic heart fever in children. And he thinks it's a plausible hypothesis that the, the rheumatic heart fever isn't carried into the body through uh, throat infections, through strep throat, but in fact, the main carrier may be through scabies. And that's a common skin infection in New Zealand, particularly in the low socioeconomic areas. So he's interested in investigating this. He's got a whole bunch of background research, but the story I'm gonna tell you now, I think tells a big story that's that's relevant to nutrition and expertise. So they, he goes out to a South Auckland school, he takes a couple of public health nurses with him, but they've got some training in identifying scabies and skin infections. Uh, roughly a quarter of the kids have a, a permanent or long-term skin condition, uh, which is a lot of kids in a school really, they think that's pretty high, but typical of a lower socioeconomic Auckland. And between the three of them, they do some different diagnosis and they reckon about half of that quarter have scabies and that responds well to a topical treatment. Uh, you don't want to give them a topical treatment of, uh, of corticosteroids that you'd give something like like uh, eczema because it actually makes it worse. Exactly. So well, we'd better, better check on this. So they get an, an expert, they get a de dermatologist. English fellow comes in, polka dot bow tie, the, the whole box and dice. <laughs> and you can, you know, you can imagine. And yeah. he, he goes through all their their cases and looks at the kids and he proclaims that there's not a single case of scabies to be had here uh which flabbergasts simon and the nurses and i think they end up treating these kids and of course almost all of the cases that they had identified disappear uh but i think it points to you know often we think that the expert the person who should know the most about these things often is so clouded by other things he was looking for the presence of burrows of yeah. scabies into the skin as being the diagnostic criteria but of course Simon's point is well when you're scratching your skin the burrows aren't there because you scratch the burrows off yeah. and I think you know something like low carb and keto just in carb appropriate diets in the way that you would contextualize it and something obvious like diabetes a, a disorder of, of blood glucose you can either treat it with more insulin which has a bunch of negative side effects or you could just eat less glucose in the first place and the endocrinology community seems completely utterly unable to see that as as a solution. Yet it's and for for the average layperson, it's staring them right in the face, and they're easily convinced by that as a logic, and they see effective treatments, and the science is reasonably clear. So, yeah. Well, I think with the, in the case of diabetes, the the science is beyond clear. I mean, every systematic review shows a one hundred and fifty percent greater minimum reduction in HbA1c, right, yes. from low-carb versus best-practice diets. Yeah. The, the, the caution around that is always thrown out at the end of the paper, but we don't know, blah, 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 long-term effects and, you know, whether the distortion in blood lipids is going to be negative and all this kind of stuff. But, I mean, it seems as if there's a constant backpedaling because, as you and I would see, every marker that we would want to bring down is being improved by that so whether or not someone agrees with low carb as a general topic i mean for certain things there's no doubt that it is the best intervention it's interesting in medicine because at, you know one level people can introduce all sorts of uh, medications with no known long-term effects but they seem to be relatively safe on the basis of biomarkers so, you know something like a, a oral contraceptive will be the you know obvious candidate for the biggest yeah uh, thing in the history for no long-term effects uh, they introduce a diet to guidelines with no long-term effects. You introduce a diet through a randomized trial that shows improvements in every metabolic risk factor that you 
no and it shows overall an improvement and then they go well, well no we need long-term studies on that which frankly are never going to happen the cost of doing a long-term diet study is we know from the women's health initiatives in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh and, and it's clouded anyway with the long-term adherence issues and all sorts of those things those sorts of things and you know what other dietary interventions are put through that same rigor anyway no well i think um, vegetarianism and veganism are a classic example of this where where uh, an often nutrient deficient diets are embraced um, as, as medically sounds without any sort of that even evidence or or even the metabolic improvements that you'd necessarily expect so there's and there's certainly a religious layer and and, and a belief layer over it for those types of approaches as well so where do you think that's going to shift in the next couple of years i'm really interested to know your thoughts around how dietary patterns are going to change in response to both what people are seeing in, in their health, what we're seeing in the research, and what people are considering in the global context with climate change and, and ecological sensibility. Yeah, that's a really interesting bit of thinking around there, isn't there, with all sorts of uh, fish hooks in it. And I guess the first thing I, I would say, well, I think in rich countries, uh, like the one we live in, like New Zealand, what you have seen is a... Is a on one hand, is a rapid increase in the demand for things like high-fat dairy and butter and those types of things. But an interesting, a decrease in meat consumption. Uh, so mm. the, there's, there's, there's confounding things. There's certainly an increase in, in continuous increase in processed food consumption, uh, a, a decrease in demand for things like cereals. And, and that's been plummeting uh, year on year for, a, for the last decade now. So, so those are sort of trends in buying patterns which are interesting. You've got this whole climate change, save the planet thing. And frankly, I do want to live on a planet that we can sustain. Um, whether farming and farming practices have anything to do with that isn't clear to me. It's certainly clear that there's some fairly unethical farming practices. I, I, you know, I, I, I had to cho shovel chicken crap out of a, a, a battery farming thing when I was a kid for, to raise money for the rowing team I was in. And from then on, I was deeply disturbed about about the way those animals were treated, and I refused to buy anything other than free range uh, eggs. And I think I'd be disturbed in the same way with with pig farming in this country, um, and I'd certainly be disturbed by beef farming in in the United States, especially the large, you know, multi multi hectare feed lots with nothing but concrete the whole way and the sort of resource use that means and what they they're fed on. So mm -hmm. I, I'm I, there are ethical issues around the way we raise and farm animals that we eat that doesn't that is a separate argument for the fact that meat at on its own as a uh, as a food stuff uh, i'm not convinced there's any real evidence for that for that fresh animal products are harmful to our health i um, mean in fact you'd have to do a randomized trial where you had a diets that were relatively equivalent in nutrients, but one had the the protein and fat sources from from vegetable sources, and the other from meat, and follow those people. And I'm not aware of any such trial ever being done. That's that's the obvious way to study this scientifically. So there's that aspect. So I, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, animal products in their whole state are nothing but healthful. Seems obvious under most anthropological paleolithic type analyses and and just functional analysis of humans that we're omnivorous and <laughs> well, 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 you know, we, we, we are and absolutely there's so, no doubt so, so that's that's that um can, there seems to be very little discussion about the number of people on the planet that's just sort of an inevitable fact that we've dealt with and at some point there's too many people how yeah. do we manage that for the resources that we have available. And those are the arguments I think we should be having rather than meat versus non-meat. It's also interesting to me, I was away in the weekend um, doing some work and, and I was under attack from the, because I you know sort of supporting a, a low carb and a keto type approach, but I was under attack, under attack from the from the carnivore guys for being too mainstream. So, you know, like, you're like getting at both sides. <laughs> Welcome to my world, mate. Yeah. So, so I was like, oh, oh no. okay. The, it used to, I used to get criticism from the, the orthodox dietitians and docs and whatnot who were saying I was killing people because I was bringing their blood glucose and triglycerides down. I don't know how that works. Yeah. But um, now it's, yeah, that the real keto zealots and particularly the carnivore people saying, you know, how can you entertain that some people might do well on carbohydrate? 
Um, yeah, but yeah, but I mean, that, that speaks to the carb appropriate idea that I'm a big fan of, obviously. Yeah. What do you think about that? What do you think about the, the carb spectrum? Oh, absolutely. I agree. And I think there's a group of people that, I mean, obviously, there's, we vary in how insulin resistant we are. So the exact same meal for different people provokes an entirely different metabolic response. And it's the metabolic response and hormonally and and neurally and then just even through the glucose in the blood and those sorts of things that is crucial to your health and so that and that varies as i say massively between people but it is also varies within yourself both longitudinally as you age it's different but just depending on the day you had and it's highly labile if you've been very stressed then you're going to have a very different response to the dietary carbohydrates so there's an appropriate spectrum that people can fit on and for mm. some people it's beyond that. They they seem to be various types of vegetables, um, even ones low in carbohydrate. They have a have other responses to. And it, you know, remember that that one of the benefits of vegetables may be the their slight toxicity to the body, and then the hormetic yeah. response to that. And so perhaps it's that these people have have a have a a response that that's non adaptive to these, and they respond very well by dropping all carbohydrates and out altogether, including everything from vegetables. And yeah. just going fully meat and fat based, and, and they benefit. That doesn't mean that's an appropriate public health recommendation, but it is a uh, on a spectrum of people that may be able to respond to differently different diets. And that, that's I think worth considering. And equally, there's people who are quite insulin sensitive. My 16 and 17 year old boys who seem to eat a range of macronutrients without consideration and be metabolically healthy and fine and quite vibrant. Yeah, I spoke about the, the the sort of carnivore and the extreme keto side of things with Danny Lennon and yeah, Eric Helms yep. the other day on a podcast. And it was funny because obviously Eric is more of your, you know, he would hate me saying this, but he's probably more of the carb bias. I'm more of yep. the low carb bias. Danny's somewhere in between. But we all agreed that it's really interesting that people are doing carnivore now because probably like low carb did 20 years ago, mm. 30 years ago, it's starting to pose inconvenient questions for people that demand answers. You know, yeah. do we actually need as much vitamin C as we've been told if we're not eating carbohydrate? You know, do we absorb it more effectively? Uh, can we get adequate amounts of vitamin C from, from meat and organs and things like that? I think those are interesting questions, although Absolutely. I still think that um, I still think that carnivore is probably a risky diet if you don't need to do it. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and People may thrive on it, you know, and good for you. Um, that yeah. is the one where I would go, I actually don't have any idea about the long-term implications of that. I mean, obviously, whole societies seem to have persisted well on that, but those may be societies with different makeups than you and I, and I'm just not certain about that. I would say that there's no, from what I've seen, there are no truly carnivore populations yeah. and probably actually no habitually long-term ketogenic populations either yeah but because yeah, so, there's seasonal variability and you know locational variability there's you know so much that goes into that and there's also you now I, I don't remember this but but you can tell me is that the whole idea within you it is that there a propensity to form nutritional ketosis is actually quite different than say you and i would be yeah um that that's been what has been posited in the research for a long time, since I think since the 1930s, you know, they were starting to measure ketone levels yeah. that far yeah, right. back. And basically everything has shown that they, they weren't necessarily in habitual ketosis and that the reasons for that were purportedly that they ate too much protein, like massive amounts of protein up to sort of 50 plus percent of yeah. the diet in some cases. Uh, but also, and because of that, obviously they have really, um, really high levels of gluconeogenesis. They have uh, a genetic, genetic propensity to not go into ketosis so that they can burn fatty acids at a higher rate because yeah. that's more thermic. Yeah. And that's through the um, that malfunction in the carnitine palmitol uh, transferase gene. Recently, there's been some discussion about that and whether the measurement was wrong uh, or the measurements were wrong and whether enough samples had been taken across populations to really answer that question but unfortunately the paper that came out suggesting that was was pretty uh, i thought it was pretty poorly written and there were a number of um 
inconsistencies in the paper that I, I just couldn't really take it seriously. Yeah. But it, it was a pretty interesting uh, thing again because you know we've we've got these holy cows, sacred cows, like the fact that hey. Inuit, being the lowest carb-consuming population in history, still don't get into ketosis, or do they? Yes. Yeah, that's interesting stuff. Yeah. So what do you think will be the biggest shifts in nutrition in, say, the next five years? Well, it's interesting. The whole um, plant-based thing seems to be on a massive roll. Uh, what's you don't, you don't think it's cresting and, and falling now? Oh, uh, I think you're not going to see that, and I'll tell you why. And I, uh, uh, You don't want to get too conspiratorial about it, but when the Adventists themselves published their own paper showing the influence they'd had in, in the investing in these sorts of things. So you've got quite large mm. groups investing a lot of money in society and, and it's, you have to only get the Sunday paper to see the full page ads on plant-based diets. I mean, I'm into a plant-based diet, frankly. It just happens to have meat in it as well. The, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not anti-vegetables, but to, to claim that meat's bad for you. I think people do are concerned about the planet and there's that whole sequestration carbon emission stuff they buy uh, mm -hmm. interestingly i think we're understanding more fully now that they bugged up the methane calculations because the your half-life of methane in the atmosphere is like 10 years compared to carbon dioxide which is more like 100 years so uh the 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 contribution that animal farming particularly beef farming is is much less than you would have uh, thought but i still think that's got a roll on at the moment and i think you're going to see a, a big increase in that you've got this whole uh, I'm not thrilled about this, by the way. I'm just saying the way I think it'll probably roll out. Uh, this whole uh, meat-free meat stuff, which is just a bizarre situation. You know, it's, it, we're talking about eating whole unprocessed food, which is the one thing we probably should be agreeing on. And we've got that whole artificial meat stuff coming. And I just, oh, I hope I never eat any. Uh, and that, you know, that's that's going. Uh, Low-carbon keto will continue to grow, but I think it's in. It's been in niche communities. It's been really interesting to me that uh, in the US in particular, one of the growth communities for low-carb keto and then I guess carnivore type stuff has been that sort of Silicon Valley entrepreneur, early adopter type big time. community rather than, yeah, big time. Uh, so yeah, maybe that's got promise about that growing into mainstream, but who knows? Well, keto, as far as I've seen in the last year, it's been, because I've been tracking the Google analytics and stuff, it's it's definitely the the biggest trending thing in nutrition it's not the biggest yet because plant-based kills everything else right yeah yeah um but it's it's well overtaken paleo now which was obviously five years ago probably the biggest trending movement yeah and so it's pretty interesting that you've got almost these two dichotomous movements that are growing quickly and obviously mm -hmm. plant-based is is you know the predominant one but i really wonder about the the ecological ramifications of diet because i think we're at risk of falling into what happened in the 60s and 70s through the formulation of these dietary guidelines where we're rushing based on what we see as being this big problem that's looming rushing into solutions that aren't based on strong enough evidence yeah yeah that's right and it's it's easy to do that it's like we need urgent solutions the the planet is is warming up there's all these ramifications yeah let's just do this we don't actually know if it's worth you know what i'm the most scared about cliff i actually think that at some point in the next century someone's just going to go well bugger this will just let off a bunch of uh, i don't know whatever thing they work out silver balloons or something into the atmosphere and and um we'll make the planet a bit darker and it'll cool down you know something ridiculous <laughs> like that um and i, I yeah. think that's actually possible not only possible but likely and you know then we're interfering with stuff that we have no idea with and where has that ever worked out well in the it, past you it, know? it never had <laughs> and i used to be really septic against the climate change deniers but actually what you're seeing in climate change is a widespread oh the consensus is this you know the majority of scientists says that and it there is no argument that i'm aware of ever where science is taken the, the, there is a democracy of science and you have a vote and the people who have with the most votes win. It's not like that. It's based on data and outcomes and that's the only thing it should be based on. Now, I do buy the idea there's more carbon dioxide and methane and, and those are likely to be human made. Yeah. So I'm not denying that but I, or, or I'm, a, I'm no climate change denier but I think the, the argument is the majority of people think this is being ridiculous. I was recently, well not recently, a couple of years ago taking a side by an eminent professor of nutrition in this country and told in those uncertain terms, well, look, 
you think this and every other professor of nutrition and public health in the country thinks this, how could you possibly write? And I was like, well, science is not a democracy. Exactly. Uh, and he goes, are you saying that idiot? So I was like, no, 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 not at all, just that they're wrong. And, you know, so how do you have an argument on that, on that basis? Exactly. And I think we, we need to be debating, right? And we need to be debating based on the evidence, but we're all going to, at the end of the day, it comes down to opinion because we're all going to form opinions based on the evidence that we're presented with. Yeah. And so we, it can't ever be this clear thing where the science says exactly this. And yeah. so if you're not in line with that, you're wrong because the, the science gives us data and we interpret that data for how we can translate that into either clinical practice or into public health guidelines or whatever it happens to be. And I just think that with particularly the climate change thing, I'm like you, I'm not a climate change denier at all. In fact, I'm I'm very convinced of the science that there is man-made uh, or man-driven climate change and that it is a big problem. I just think that a lot of the models we have, particularly with food production that are being used to justify solutions are very immature at this stage and we need to do a lot more research to see what what, what is actually appropriate. Agreed, absolutely agreed. I also, I don't know if you saw it, but I did a little uh, analysis and whether it, I, I got it 100% correct or not, I'm not sure, but I, I pulled a whole bunch of data from, um, you know, cattle associations in the States and yeah. grain producing associations and all sorts of things and did some calculations on the sentient lives lost from oh, yeah, soy so versus yeah, 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 yeah. beef. Yeah. And you basically, you kill more animals eating soy. Yeah. Um, probably also eventually yourself, but that's probably a debate for another day. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. That's a really interesting um, point. And it just makes, the, the trouble with these arguments is it's very, there's very much uh, beliefs precede evidence and then evidence is brought in to back up the belief. And that's, uh, you know, how, how most things in society roll, unfortunately. Yeah. So getting back to the, the real nitty gritty of nutrition, we, we've done a bunch of research over the last couple of years. Um, you've obviously been my PhD supervisor and supported me through that process. We've looked at a range of different things and, and particularly the different outcomes from, say, non-keto, more moderate, low-carb diets versus yeah. true low-carb versus keto. Based on that, what, what are your... What are your impressions now based on that research? That, for example, do you think keto is necessary or not? Well, I think there's a few things. One at still one at a time that I think about your research that's um, been interesting to me. The first is this sort of whole keto flu, keto induction thing. I think in general, actually the effects don't last that long and aren't that severe. And that's yeah. good to document that. And I, I, you'd agree with that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And I think most interestingly out of that last study, which um, we're about to publish the paper showing this, uh, the, the strongest association was with energy restriction, not with carb restriction. Yes. Um, and so then the next thing is there is some variation. So some people do get some reasonably severe symptoms. There was, you know, one or two in that uh, first trial you did, and, and some have virtually no symptoms whatsoever. The The thing that stands very clearly in my mind is we do, I remember doing some focus groups and this one woman said, who was the mother of young children, said, oh, yeah, yeah I had quite bad symptoms. And we're like, oh, how bad were that? <laughs> and she was like, oh, well, I couldn't really get out of bed the whole weekend. And the kids, you know, who were two, three and four were just running loose around the house and my husband was away and I didn't really know what was going on at all. And you were sort of looking at your going, um, so why didn't you sort of call me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so here was one example. And then we had another woman inside, did you get anything? So nothing, just no, no, didn't really notice any change. And you know, got into ketosis and all that. And then the interesting thing was when we asked them about whether they're going to continue with it, the woman who had had the severe symptoms was like, oh, hell yeah, I feel so much better now. This is awesome. And the woman who had no symptoms was like, oh, you yeah. know. So we all, always, that just made me wonder about even if there are symptoms, we often assume that 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 poor symptoms are, are really a negative thing. Yeah. Um, and in fact, in this way, there was sort of something associated with it. She's like, well, I've been through this. I might as well carry on. So that, that that's interesting. That's that's the first thing. So symptoms and ketosis and severity. And it was almost, almost a transcendence thing, wasn't it? Once you yes, got through yes, it, you know, yes. it was like the challenge is overcome and now this is great. Yeah. And I, and I now, because I assume she was so carb addicted that, 
I actually feel good and I'm not getting this hunger for the first time in life and blah, blah, blah. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, uh, yeah, you can get some minor improvements with, with MCT oil and uh, I guess it could, could be good. Uh, there's, there's downsides to MCT oil, which I've observed on myself. <laughs> so it's a disaster pants type stuff, but you know that, that, that's besides the thing. The, the third thing is really that, that question about the amount of carbohydrate restriction and whether you need to get into initial nutritional ketosis to see most of the benefits. And I think I'm not 100% clear on that. I th the first thing I would say on that study that you did, can, can you get benefits? Or pe when you ask people to restrict their carbohydrates in different ways, is there any adherence to that that looks resembles what you've told them? The answer is yes. Mm. And that's, that is a big finding in itself. I think that's an amazing thing. It's like, well, people just go, well, they won't do it. They won't know how to do it, they won't sustain it. Well, they do, um, at least the way you advise them, which is didn't seem too complex. And I think that's, that's a translatable message. Um, the second thing is that there's benefits from all those different levels of carbohydrate restriction. I, I still think on a more highly powered study with more metabolically unhealthy people, I think part of the thing is there's, there's a real decision that we made about studying healthy people rather than people that had serious metabolic syndrome mm. and seeing their responses. I actually personally think if we had, and this, we don't have the data for this, but if we'd studied people with metabolic syndrome, we might have seen uh, a more profound benefit of more serious restriction in carbohydrate um, and yeah. what that may have meant for keto induction symptoms and adherence is not clear to us so that's a question we haven't answered and yeah. i still think needs answering but for a healthy population i no, i think some degree of carbohydrate restriction is beneficial and the, and the differences in metabolic health are, are, are minor is that, yeah. is, that, is that what you would say, given we're about to probably go into a, a defense of this thing? Absolutely. I, yeah. I think that, you know, the, the differences between the interventions were relatively minor. I think the adherence between all of them was pretty much the same, even yeah. though there's been a lot made about that in the, the mainstream, that the very low carb group didn't quite manage to hit their 5% level of carbs consistently. It didn't matter because they could consistently hit 8%. So it was yeah. almost like yeah. the... The aspirational aspect of trying to get to five percent they were still much lower than the other groups yes and they were able to sustain that yeah but I, I still think one of the interesting things and whether it translates to to what people want to do or not is is unimportant there still is in basically every study we look at a trend towards better results overall not per individual but overall from a greater carb restriction that's right, and that's why I suspect with the metab if we had people with meta full metabolic syndrome, we're going to see profound improvements at the highest end of carbohydrate restriction. And I think that's probably in support of what you would call your carb-appropriate message is that for your metabolically healthy person, there's a range of values you can improve over. And I think with uh, then it's probably likely that you're going to improve uh, more. And I think I've seen that in other studies as well. But, you know, People with metabolic poor health have magnitudes of improvement with full uh, keto carb restriction. You see that in those volic type studies um, yeah. of a much larger magnitude than what you were able to observe in your one. And it wasn't an adherence issue, it was simply a room to move issue. Yeah. Now, if your triglycerides are already 1.4, yeah, you, you can't improve by 1.5. No, exactly. <laughs> or, or even one, you know, you can't. There's just a, there's a ceiling effect there. Yeah, and no, I think. You know, we certainly saw that graphically in, in the early analysis before I had done a, a full sort of analysis and we found that there wasn't necessarily, um, you know, large effect sizes there and there wasn't necessarily significance with all the measures. Yeah. It was interesting just looking graphically at all the measures and seeing some consistency in that association between your baseline marker and, and your change, depending on, you know, what that was. And, and that to me was pretty interesting because for all the major markers again that we would look at like hdl and triglycerides it seemed to be that progression where if you were more metabolically healthy at baseline given they were all metabolically healthy but the more metabolically healthy yeah actually did better on less restriction whereas those who were less metabolically healthy did far better on the greater restriction so i still think that's interesting in a sort of probability setting yeah, yeah absolutely and i think you also make a very important point about data and data analysis and data presentation and it's really hard to understand what happened in a study 
without seeing figures, graphs with individual data points of scattered across them and going, well, look, what does this look like? This is happening here and here. And to be able to see that, and I guess I call it getting your hands dirty with the data, is just crucial. But it's also really important when you're presenting the d data to someone else to show the same thing. It's all very well putting up a table and going, this was significant. But really, they have no idea of what the totality of your results look like. And it's, I'd much rather see something free of things like significance and going, well, here's what I saw. Make what you want out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's the range of values and across the different people, and this is what what they got. Well, what do you think? And yeah. So someone as a practitioner is going to think someone different who's into this part of science, and that's a missing step in science. And I was really pleased that you were able to do that uh, that level. I think we talked about that quite a lot early on. You know, get your hands dirty with it and see what it says, and it allows a much uh, much broader interpretation of, of the science. And we would probably wouldn't be in this mess, especially of epidemiology, if people looked at it that way. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the classic for this is that there's a Hooper et al. Uh, Cochrane Review meta-analysis of randomized trials for saturated fat reduction and, and, and uh, different outcomes from coronary events to, to, uh, to symptoms to mortality. And you don't really see anything for those things except for coronary events. And it's it's really interesting because you look at the intervention group versus the control group, and there's there's more events in the intervention group when you take up the totality of the studies and you put all the, all the trials together. You go, well, this is ridiculous. In reality, these randomized trials were done, and you know we had 950 heart attacks and symptoms related to heart attacks in this group, and we had... I can't remember the exact numbers, and 980 in this group, and this was the group that got the saturated fat reduction, so they actually had more. And they go, oh, no, 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 nothing to do with it. Uh, there's there's a confounding effect of this was a bigger study than that study, and so we need some statistical adjustment to you know, buggerise around with this, and all of a sudden the, the, the result that happened in reality is reversed. Yeah. Then you go, well, <laughs> how does that make any sense? We did these trials, and the people who were in the trial got, Trials got more heart attacks, but because we think this and that and we change this, um, we get the exact opposite result, which didn't even occur in reality. So yeah. you know, that's why looking at the data, understanding the raw data and seeing what it says is such a crucial thing. And it's really hard to, if you're not trained in that or, or spending that, well, not so much trained, but just spending the time to be bothered doing it, yeah, you know, to take that on its face value. And another classic example that's exploded in the last couple of weeks has been the University of Otago's um, Professor Jim Mann's claims about <laughs> in two studies, one a, a, a fibre study, yeah. uh, a, another a meta-analysis, which I think does show um, some small beneficial effects across populations by you know with higher fibre intakes mm -hmm. um, for whole grains and the grains from fibre. There's only um, weak evidence, so you wouldn't on that basis be any form of public health recommendation. Mann goes on to say that this is clear evidence that low carbohydrate diets, uh, this is really the death now for them because you can't get enough fiber from them. And this study has nothing to do with low carbohydrate diets. And um, not only that, is that Karen Zinn's published quite good papers showing the fiber adequacy, if you believe that's even useful for well-formulated low carbohydrate diets. As Seymour Hotra goes in front of the English parliament uh, and raises this, and just, I think this is, people underestimate this event. This is probably the biggest naming and shaming in the history of public health nutrition. We're in front of the UK Parliament, live streamed, and then all, now, how you all the way around, he, he rid it publicly ridicules man and puts up um, Zinn's research to refute that. So, yeah, that's been going on. And then the following week, same bloke comes out with a, another Chinese study where they they had moderate carb eaters and high carb eaters, and they, that in China, they, they substitute some of the carbs they're eating with soybean oil, and they notice that the, the gut bacteria deteriorates. And again, the claim is, well, low-carbohydrate diets, the death knell, they destroy your, your bug, the, the gut microbes. And the astonishing thing about that is we've known that soybean oil is toxic to gut microbiota in the quantities that man was talking about since 1945. You know, we hardly even knew yeah. that, but one of the first things we knew was that soybean oil and, and other poofers are uh, toxic in that sense and inflammatory and, and create a whole 
chain. Uh, and so if any one of the public had just look, had access to look at the data and yeah. enough interest, they would just go, huh, you're joking. And I guess we're seeing more and more of that as, as interested public have a look at that. And, and that's, it's difficult, you know. I, I think that I always bring up the diet fit study because I think it's such yeah. a great example because it's actually a good study. Yeah. You know, very well performed study. It was um, controlled extremely well. The diet interventions were, were good because they were both on good diets, unlike some yes. of the old sort of vegan yes. diets and things yep. like that. But at the end of the day, you're comparing two healthy diets with one with a fairly modest restriction in carbohydrate. And yeah. yet the conclusion being that, well, there's no difference between them after 12 months. There was a difference between them yeah. because in basically every category, the low carb group got better results, mm -hmm. although it wasn't significant, except it was pretty close to significance for BMI. And it was definitely significant for improvements in HDL and triglycerides. So yeah. I would be looking at, well, for future health risk, if you can adhere to both equally well, go lower yeah. carb. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, and I, mean, I think the lower carb thing's becoming obvious now. If you if you if you understand your basic physiology around glycemia and hyperinsulin anemia, and the metabolic effects of high glucose and insulin, then it just makes total logical sense. And it's borne out with the trial data that that what we're going to see is, in fact, um, improved metabolic health by reducing the 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 amount of times your blood glucose is up high or or is just high, um, and same for insulin. I mean, why would you expect anything different than that? Exactly. Yeah. So we've talked carbs. I've been fairly big through the years on high protein diets as well. And I think yeah. that got left out in the cold a little bit as keto mm. rose to prominence. Where are you with higher protein diets? Yeah, it's interesting. I, and I've been thinking about revising some of the stuff I've written and what the fact, because I now think it's wrong. Uh, and I think it'd be wrong for specific populations. So I really never mentioned any of the sort of protein leverage work that I think I need to revisit. And I mm. think particularly that it may be particularly some of the indigenous populations who have, who have persisted on much higher protein um, diets do very well by leveraging protein and using that as a satiating factor. And we need to understand that more. And I think yeah. I wrongly wrote in what the fat uh, in, in a sort of simplistic way about, you know, because we observe that often when you start to eat extra protein, on a ketogenic diet, you knock yourself out of nutritional ketosis. And I just assume, well, the only possible mechanism for that is a gluconeogenesis and you're just pumping more glucose out. And I yeah. no longer believe that's totally the case as well. I don't even understand that full mechanism. And I need to do better there. Probably need to talk to you about it more. But I do need to revise both of that, those uh, things. I think what I would now say about low-carb healthy fat is it's an adequate protein diet at the minimum. So you want yeah. to be getting adequate protein. Like it's not a low protein diet. So adequate and how does that? What does adequate mean? Well, it's a sort of circular argument that well, you, you may need more if you've got these needs or that needs. Um, do you do worse if you somehow leverage a bit more protein in and do that? No, probably probably not. And that may be different for other people. And, and so we need to. We could probably start to consider some of the uh, protein appropriateness. And I'm not sure exactly how that would work. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I, I agree. I think that for, for me, protein is probably the most important thing to set for a client first. Yeah. So I do that based on their desired outcomes, not on the you know desire to sort of mitigate gluconeogenesis and things, because if it's based on their desired outcomes, it's going to be appropriate based on the research as to what's most effective. Yeah. And because gluconeogenesis is demand driven, not supply driven. Yeah it should actually fit in with their calorific quotient and mm. there should be enough fuel providing macro either from fat or, or carbs or some combination of both yeah. to, to basically provide for that. Yeah. I, I also think that we freak out way too much because you mentioned it about the, about getting kicked out of ketosis. Yeah. Because I know from experience that if, if I'm in ketosis, let's say I'm sitting consistently over one millimole. Yeah. Even if I have a big, low protein, high fat meal and test myself immediately afterwards, I'll often be out of ketosis anyway. Yeah. For whatever reason, probably just the the amount of insulin that I produce in response to just, just protein alone, you know, that yeah. initial insulin hit yeah, yeah, yeah. stops yeah. your ketosis, but you, you get back in pretty quickly. So I think people forget that we, it, again, ketosis and ketones like carbs is a spectrum. Absolutely. On off switch. Yeah. 
I mean, like honestly, being well fat adapted and a nutritional taste, and I know we've talked about this, I can go utterly off the reservation, you know, like beers, chips, the whole thing, and be back in nutritional ketosis the next day with a little bit of fasting. Exactly. It was my yeah. cornflake experiment that. Um, oh, that's right. How's that going? Are you still eating cornflakes? <laughs> Not anymore. No. I'm actually on an anti inflammatory diet at the moment, which is working really well. But yeah. um, that was a sort of experiment that I did for a while, as you know. And a, a buddy of mine from the UCAN company, because I do a bit with UCAN, they sent, he sent the my results through to Steve Finney and Jeff Follick, and they said, no, nah, that can't happen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the only thing I didn't like about the cornflakes was this whole Aventus connection with, with uh, John Harvey Kellogg and the masturbation <laughs> theory and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, exactly. yeah that's, that's a story for another day. Not a big fan of, of that stuff. And no. it certainly doesn't fit with an anti-inflammatory diet. But no. I, I think it is interesting that now, you know, the, the work that's being done with the Gonzo self-experimenters out in the field, um, yeah. you know, your, your Paul Cadmans, your Dan Plews, yourself, me, you know, all these weird yeah. people doing weird things. We're blowing the doors off what people thought ketosis was all about yeah you know we we got blowback obviously from that reviewer for one of our papers because he couldn't put ketosis or ketogenic diets in any other context than a really low protein really high fat diet for kids with epilepsy absolutely and yeah. over three millimoles and That's people just kind of people just kind of achieve that normally anyway and, they no, don't need and, and, and why would you want to exactly yeah Exactly. And particularly now when we've got, if you did want higher ketones, we've got cool things like MCTs and whatnot. The diet can be a lot less restrictive than people think. And I think we're too often mired in the old the old paradigm of keto for epilepsy. And I think we're going to break out of that. Yeah, that seems to be stuck there. And I think, as you say, have you had Dan Plews on your show? Yeah, Dan, um, Dan and... Paul I had last year and yeah. their podcasts were the biggest by far because people are fascinated by mixed fueling. Yeah. So, you know, I've just been working with Dan quite closely and uh, with this sort of stuff. And then I've been training, I just trained an athlete to do the I New Zealand last weekend. It did really well, fat adapter, but it's that mixed fuel use. And you'd be surprised how many calves we actually use, first of all, on the day, but then particular training sessions, like it's, it's actually, you know, the keto people would just be going, holy, but... I mean, I have um, this guy, Matt, I'd have him do these sessions with a reasonable amount of intensity, a lot of carbs out. We might add, oh, I don't know, 200 grams of carbs in this session. At the end of it, he's still in nutritional ketosis. Exactly. So, and yeah. That, that's why I think we've discussed a lot, and with, with um, Karen Zinn as well, about the the difference between the mainstream perception of you must have under X amount of grams per day of carbohydrate to be in ketosis. Yeah versus what I've thought for the last 20 odd years, which is it doesn't really matter as long as there is a, an appropriate percentage of carbohydrate of your calorie requirement. Yeah, and there's also a flux of different fuel utilization out as well, which makes a massive difference. It's like people going, you need eight glasses of water. Well, look, it would totally be different if you're sitting in a sauna all day, if you're sitting in a freezer, you know, like <laughs> there's different there's different outs. So... <laughs> <laughs> And that, that area, I think, is fascinating. And I, I would love, you know, maybe we can do this in the next year or yeah. something, but I would love to look more at some of the old paradigms that have been used by athletes for probably 50 years, yeah. like cyclic ketogenic diets and targeted ketogenic diets, really yeah. looking at that mixed fuel usage and and looking at whether there are additional benefits from that because there, there are so many unanswered questions in the area of keto. Yeah. Like, I, I really subscribe to the increasingly to the idea that that this uh, cycling of, of anabolic and catabolic is really what's crucial for long-term human health and well-being and so you know moving in and out of nutritional ketosis is an absolutely natural thing yeah. and one end you'll go down to the shopping mall and you go well okay find the person in nutritional ketosis it's like no one and so, <laughs> so, so they're in a constantly anabolic state and that's obviously a problem metabolically and that's probably where major public health issues are equally i think you know the going st i'm strict keto and trying to stay in a nutritional ketosis and this is a really strong therapeutic reason that you might need to be i actually think it's a mistake um both behavioral but probably physiologically as well and it's that mix of signaling up and down and it's sort of like intermittent fasting for some of that um i like weekends because sometimes on weekends you get a bit carried away with your friends and i'm not advocating junk food but it certainly allows that sort of anabolic catabolic transition uh, easily 
to to move in and out. And I, that's something that I really I, I think is going to be an interesting idea as we move forward for those people who are really interested in not so much public health, but in maximizing their own health and well-being. Yeah. I also think, you know, going back to that sort of question of what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years, I think we are going to begin to drill down a lot more into the behavioral side of nutrition yeah. and even more than that, the mind-body ramifications of health. But I think a big part of that is is developing those strategies. You know, I sort of call it having freedom within structure. Yeah. Like what you suggest, if, if you know, if, for example, my partner and I are, are low-carb pretty strictly through the week. Yeah. But we have our treats in the weekend because yeah. our area under the curve of carbon take is still pretty freaking low. Yeah. It just works behaviorally. Right. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So um who are your go to people? I think you've mentioned a few of them, but right now who who are you finding really interesting in the nutrition space to, to go to and get information from? Uh what's interesting, I've actually been slight rather than nutrition at the moment, I've been slightly more into mind body stuff. In the <laughs> you and I swap back and forth, eh? Yeah, yeah, no, I've been really at the, well, well, it depends on what time frame you're over. So, my normal go tos are your um, Volux, your Finneys, and those um, types of guys. I started listening to Peter Atia a bit, but then he actually got too much for me because I actually think he was a, a he's just getting too bloody arrogant and it pissed me off in a Tim Ferriss sort of way because I was <laughs> find quite quite interesting. So, it's a little bit like talkback radio, you can only take too much of it. Um, yeah. And more recently, I've actually just started to be doing a lot of Sam Harris and, and the sort of waking up type um, meditation stuff. I've been really interested in mainly through a special forces soldier that I was working with, with um, nasal breathing and nitric oxide and those uh, pathways. Um, those obviously have implications for insulin resistance, vasodilation and, and those sorts of things. I still think the mind-body, interestingly, I think the mind-body stuff is uh, our sleep and its role and how nutrition interacts with that, um, the, the, the use of carbs for better night's sleep, I think that actually does have a role. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm actually, that's the space I'm most just reading about in my laying around time at the moment and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, go to nutrition. I mean, we've still just got our standard trial stuff. There's, as you know, there's a paper, there's a paper a week that needs reading and, and rebutting or is interesting. Uh, and that could come from anywhere at the moment because there, there's a lot of research going on around the world. What about you? What were you in the? Were you in the mind body space? Speaking of that, I'm become especially now coming to the the end of this sort of PhD process. I'm more and more interested in it as I was, you know, before starting this process because I think that it's the next step in in health. I think it's yep. the next step in medicine. Yeah. And I think we're getting to a point now where it's not enough to set the foundations of health through nutrition and physical exercise and things like that, yeah. and all the rest, sleep and whatnot. Because if you do all of that, you're still not necessarily living an objectively desirable life. There's got to be something yeah. more than that. And yeah. that comes from you know discovering creativity, passion, and purpose and those things. And I think the whole spectrum from the foundations of health right up to creativity, passion, and purpose basically rests on how we can have a positive mind body state yeah and so i think there's gonna i think there's exciting things to look at in the research there and i've got a bunch of ideas that i'll throw by you at some point but um you know i would love to go on and do a lot more of that research as well as you know keep filling in these gaps in the nutrition research as well yeah and they're not sort of separate things they they quite deeply interact and I, you know one of the um amazing things to me is you know, a, a simple, uh, quick mindfulness meditation of even, you know, five or six breath, deep, uh, relaxed, empty mind belly breaths before you eat a meal and the profoundly different glucose and in insulin response you have, you know, it's, it's astonishing. I mean, you can, you can have it yeah. by that one behavior. And so when you start Ooh. to think about metabolic health as just being what you put in your mouth, it's, it's, it's not, not the case. There's even a bunch of studies coming out. I think um, that the guys at Mass that Eric's involved with have just um, yeah. reposted one as well. There's a bunch of studies that seem to be coming out showing that our perception of of food uh, has a massive impact on how we respond to it physiologically as well. You know, whether right. that was the you remember the study on the, um, the the two drinks. One was a weight loss drink, and one was a oh, yeah. weight gain drink. Yeah. Same yeah. drink, but people's leptin and ghrelin responses were completely different to the the two drinks, depending on what they thought they were. 
Well, it's astonishing, isn't it? And and to fully unpack that and and understand how to deal with that and what that might mean behaviourally is just not clear to me. But it's it's cool, and we it's, need to. Yeah, and to, so then to just treat food as the it's just what goes into your mouth and the physiological response to that by itself is clearly not the case. No, I mean it's 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 very exciting, and I think it's it's been bubbling away for a long time. You know, you remember the old um, that Dianabol study where they gave people placebo Dianabol, a steroid, yep. and they put yep. on massive amounts of muscle compared to the control group. Yeah, it was crazy, but yeah, interesting yeah, stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, well, the, it, 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 most of my reading recently has been I've read I've read uh, read two books that Simon Thorne got me onto. One was called uh, Cracked: Why Psychiatry Does More Harm Than Good, and then oh, another yeah. one called uh, Placebo, which was written by an Australian uh, professor of orthopedics. And those are both um, really interesting and good reads if you're thinking about medicine and, and where it goes, you know, creating cases, creating sickness, um, and then creating cures that don't even work. And, and the ethics of that and those sorts of things are uh, something that's worth considering, well, especially in the context of those things that you just mentioned. Yeah, no, I mean, it sounds, when we start talking about things like that, again, it sounds conspiratorial, but from what I've seen, there's been some pretty good reviews of the eff efficacy of antidepressants for standard depression. I think there's a bit of a difference when it's really severe major depressive disorder, but for standard prescription of depression, and the results are terrible when you compare them to placebo. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So placebos work, but um, only as well as is the drug. <laughs> drug, yeah. But I think I think that's slightly different for for more serious depressions where there's probably some yeah. for some some drugs, and then you look at other things like uh, bipolar, uh, psychotic disorders, and these sorts of things, and you just go, oh my god, you know, the balance of 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 harm versus good needs to be yeah. taken into consideration as well. And that that's also the same case with with uh, orthopedics, and you sort of look at the efficacy of surgery. Um, above sham surgery, yeah, it's just non-existent for a whole bunch of things. But then, on a couple of things, you know, like a hip replacement, it actually does work. Yeah, um, and you're way better off. But you know, a knee arthroscopy for 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 uh, for a minor tear, no, nah, you might as well just do nothing. Uh, but but you need to think that you've done something. So yeah, there's a how, how do you unpack that? That's all interesting. Well, I wonder, um, you know, to sort of tie that off, I wonder if maybe in the next decade we might move towards. Uh, a more gentle approach first approach to to health whereby we are looking for example for chronic back pain at yeah. nutrition interventions and mind body meditation things like that in the first instance rather than jumping straight into surgery i mean that would make that would make sense to me because the the evidence is there anyway yeah it's interesting but what you're going to need is, is that there's a guy glenn davies who's a general practitioner down Taupo who I'm working with a, he's got a reversing diabetes group he's got a thousand odd of them on it now he's really got yeah. it down it. there's a there's a Mirai and um uh Watanui, which is 10k down the road towards Turangi the whole Mirai has decided for some reason to go keto um it's extraordinary but uh one of the reasons for that is Glenn's just like okay I'm just, uh, in the first instance I don't if you want to come to me I don't do statins hypertensives antidepressants I'm oh, sorry, I just don't do them. You, you, you're going to have a go at these nutrition and lifestyle interventions first. Otherwise, I'm not the doctor. Find someone else. And you know, that's pretty brave. Uh, and But we'd need that sort of widespread change in, in general practice medicine, that yeah. sort of attitude to start to pervade. And I, I, I think that's possible. I think many physicians that I talk to are disillusioned with the work they do. And in yeah. many ways, their life exists outside of their practice they now do that to get some money and they'll go mountain biking or hiking or whatever they want to do and you know they, that, that that's not they've lost interest in their career which is such a shame because it was pretty much the smartest guys always went off to med school and they, they didn't stay that way yeah yeah well I, I think we're seeing a bit of a groundswell of change you know, we're just it, just from the work that you've been doing with low carb GPs, and you know, I've seen a lot of that. I now get a, a huge amount of referrals from GPs. You know, I was asked to speak at Acnum a, a bunch of times, actually, yeah. as, as you're we're both speaking there again. But I find that really interesting because you've got doctors that take a more holistic yet evidence based approach, and that they are looking outside of the norm for additional advice and uh, additional information. Yeah, well, the interesting, I think, in Australia at the moment, um, as part of that whole Acnum thing, I. Uh, integrative medicine is taking a bit of a beating at the hands of uh, conventional practice because of the, you know, going, well, where's the evidence for this, where's the evidence for that? And the mind body stuff is there. Um, 
but I just, yeah, just yeah. So w with that in mind, what what does the next year hold for you, Graham? What are you working on that's exciting right now, and where do you th see things going in the next year for you? Uh, well, I've got a few things going. So well, on our sort of low carb stuff, we just put out a new low carb recipe book, the What the Fat Recipes, that's came out on last Friday, so that's cool. Just and you know, where can yeah. where can people find that, Graham? Uh, whatthefatbook.com or you know just any local bookstore. And all over the place. You're, yeah, you're all over star. the place in most countries, so that's all good. <laughs> um, the second thing, we're in this uh, pre-cure, which is a social enterprise. Pre-cure with a K. Prevention, yep. prevention is cure. Uh, food is medicine. Fitness is medicine, that sort of stuff. Uh, to try and offer easy to digest packages. It, I think tertiary education has utterly lost its way. So you know, I, I know I work for a university as well. But the value proposition of tertiary education, I think you're going to find... Um, is flimsy yeah. the, for, for the money involved. If you had to turn up with cash for the full cost of your education every time you saw someone, um, you go, oh, here, I asked, I'm here to sit my exam, here's $3,000. You know, it's astonishingly poor. And yeah. so that, I think you're going to find the, the private training industry is going to overwhelm that with niche work. And our niche is to try and uh, teach lifestyle medicine, prevention is cure, particularly to the medical profession and health health uh health profession so i've got that on the go uh awesome. research wise i'm i'm still interested in uh the idea that cities could be designed around kids not cars and the free range kid and that sort of social network i'm still interested in that i've got a new nutrition course this year in my third year called lifestyle and nutrition and i've decided that rather than having dumbass exams and stupid stuff that no one learns in i think um, the whole course is about building a giant community garden on campus so i've sort of secured the area on the campus the size of a football field and we're just going to start a multi-year project uh, where year after year we build both the social media engagement, the um, brand, the community engagement, the actual planting and the infrastructure to support that. And so you're eventually going to see this uh, giant garden on AUT's North Campus. Um, and I'm trying to get the outdoors guys to be interested in at the same time replanting every the other dipshit grass space that never gets mowed into a, um, into a curry forest with natives and stuff. Um, the ground staff are so into it. They've already got the whole bee thing going. Um, unfortunately, we wow. didn't, didn't realise you had to have beehives off the ground when it rained. So, uh, unfortunately, the queen's actually drowned. Um, oh, no. When it last rained, but we, we had to go and get some more um, queens. Long live the queen. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Well, short lived queen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so that's that's a massive project. And, and um, research-wise, the, the low-carb stuff will continue. I'm particularly interested in, um, in the mismatch between the perceptions between oral health and general health. You know, the fat is protective in the mouth. Starch of all sorts is, is, is mm. a problem. Um, and, you know, dental flossing does nothing and cleaning your teeth is, is sort of a last minute strategy to protect your everything. I think we could make progress there. The, the problem in yeah. New Zealand, um, most countries, is that the major cost in, uh, for hospitalisation and for our kids is um, being anaesthetised to get teeth filled. Um, you know, it's just disgusting, oh. totally preventable, but perhaps a teachable moment um, around yeah. diet because, you know, obesity certainly isn't. So, uh, you know, maybe we can do some stuff there. So I've got onto that and we've got a whole little research technique about asking. We've just asked a whole bunch of general practitioners and nurses and parents and 10 to 12 year old kids using the exact same technique of sorting cars to say what behaviours are the most important for your health and oral health and, and which things, which food things are best best, uh, best and worst for your body and it's a, the first of all the kids seem to know as much as the doctors uh, and there's a real mismatch between some of the things that are known to be protective and, and those that aren't so I'm interested in that's been a really interesting thing for me as well Wow so I mean you've got a a lot of things on as per usual. Yeah. I'll um I'll put in the show notes obviously how people can get in in touch with you and your work, uh, the What the Fat book site and Precure and all those things. Yep. Um also link to you on the Human Potential Center. Yep. And yep. I'm pretty stoked, Grant, to, to hopefully be involved with some of that stuff over the next couple of years as well. Yeah, let's bring it on. It's gonna be awesome. Uh, so thanks for being on the show today, mate. I, I could talk to you like literally for hours and we, we have done that many times yeah, over yeah. a few coffees. So um, I would love to get you back as well. There's a couple of things I, I didn't get around to. 
Um, I'll tease one of those out. I'm really fascinated in your opinion on um, the, the growing area of psychedelics for uh, treatment of mental disorders, oh, but yeah, we'll that's leave that for another yeah. time. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, if, you, if you're happy to come back, I'll get you back on. But thanks for being on today, mate. Cheers, mate. Awesome. Cheers, Grant.